An EU arms embargo on Syria that expires at the end of this month will not be renewed after pressure from Britain and France. But Britain's Foreign Secretary says this doesn't mean weapons will be sent to Syria's rebels immediately. We have no plans to send arms at the moment. This is a strong signal to the Assad regime that it needs to engage in the political process. Uh, and as I've always said, and as I said to our parliament last week, we would only take the step of sending arms in company with other nations, in carefully controlled circumstances, and in compliance with international law. Well, with me here in the studio are Farwaz Gurgis, who's Middle East expert at the London School of Economics and the Syrian political activist uh, Amar Wakaf. Uh, welcome to you both. And uh, Mr. Wakaf, are you in any way uh, pleased that uh, the European Union appears to be shifting a little bit uh, towards favouring the rebel movements? I don't think any Syrian who has, uh, you know, in his eyes or in her eyes, the sanity of their country and the stopping the bloodshed is going to be pleased by such a decision. Any piece of arms that goes into Syria is definitely going to prolong this suffering of our people over there. Now, there was an agreement, but Britain and France, uh, if you like, got agreement that this uh, embargo wouldn't continue. Is it going to mean anything in practice, do you well, think? Well, I mean, really, the reality, the logic behind it is to exert pressure on Assad and change its calculation. It's a, a political instrument of pressure on Assad. I don't think weapons uh, will start flowing to Syria in the near future. My fear, Adam, is that it's too little too late. The conflict in Syria has mutated from an internal conflict into an open uh, war by proxy, regional powers, international powers. Russia today just said that this particular decision harms the prospects for peace, and Russia has promised to deliver highly I mean, qualitative weapons, missiles to Syria. This tells you it's a deadly cycle of escalation and counter -es escalations inside Syria. I mean, I was interested, those Russian weapons are anti aircraft weapons. Now, we don't associate the rebel forces themselves with having any air power. Well, the Israelis have been helping the rebels, definitely. But uh, w what is interesting here is that, you know, I don't think, basically, that this decision is pretty much aimed at swaying. President Assad to do something different. I think it's actually because he will get arms, you know, in return from the Russians, whether big arms or small arms, aimed at the rebels or aimed at NATO or whatever, or the Israelis. But I think there is a bit of a power struggle amongst the opposition, either the political side or the warlords on the ground. And I think this is a message from the European Union somehow to the politicians who are heading for Geneva to get their act together and try to deliver something at Geneva. Otherwise, they'll go for the military option. We've seen the French ambassador yesterday in a leaked video really reprimanding some key figures of the Syrian opposition. And he was clearly frustrated though, that of their inability to reach something substantial. Are there any optimistic signs at all? Uh, the proposed peace conference in Geneva is the only light at the end of the tunnel. Um, of course, it forces, it faces major daunting challenges, but what's nothing there. And I think the Russians and the Americans have intensified their diplomacy. They're anxious about the spread of the conflict from Syria to neighboring countries, anxious about basically uh, a region-wide conflict that involves um, Israel on the one hand and Iran on the other hand. But the reality is we need to really understand the logic behind the British position. The Brits are extremely frustrated. Uh, carnage in Syria. Almost 100,000 people have been killed. Hezbollah and Iran are deeply helping the Assad regime. They want to do something about the situation. This is really a move. Yet at the same time, it seems to me that, that no one really has a clear idea of what regime they would like to prevail after Assad or what credible regime uh, there could be that uh, would be one that the European Union or indeed the Americans would be happy to see. Well, from a Syrian citizen's point of view, I would be happy with a, a fair sort of system or regime that could actually uh, offer equal opportunity for all, all politicians to compete on objective basis. What we're having now, unfortunately, is that there is a signal by the Europeans to the armed rebels who have foiled uh, initiatives brokered by the UN previously of ceasefire, one after the other. We have like 1,200 battalions on the ground, and each of them is capable alone of foiling such initiatives and, uh, you know, uh, giving them some hope that fight is going to lead somewhere. The idea is to have a transitional government. The idea is to ease Assad out of power. I think the presence of President Assad uh, basically uh, does more da damage to uh, than harm, uh, more, more harm than good for the Syrian people. And I think what you see the international diplomacy, particularly European diplomacy and American diplomacy, is to find ways and means 
to... But is, is there a possibility of a transitional government which would allow the sort of tolerance to both sides that we were just hearing about? At this particular point, it's extremely difficult. This is really, it's war. It's all out war. And the reality is also the opposition is deeply divided and fragmented. And that's why you don't really have a vision, a political vision inside Syria. I, think, I believe stage. that the, those who should make the decision whether Assad stays or go are the Syrian people. It's not for the European governments or British stakeholders or taxpayers to decide as such. The, uh, the, the, the situation should be set for the Syrian people to make an informed and free decision. That's the only way we can head forward. Well, I mean, the question on the table is that who are we talking about when we say the Syrian people? Does really President Assad represent the will of the Syrian people? How extensive is opposition to the Syrian people? Well, the reality is there actually. is a political struggle inside Syria. There is overwhelming opposition to President Assad. Mm. President Assad has used massive force in order to undermine and defeat this particular yeah. opposition. He is fully responsible yes. for the crisis that has emerged. Let's not lose sight. Basically, the responsibility, moral and political responsibility, yeah. President Assad. What, okay, guarantee, what guarantee do we have if we actually put pressure on President Assad to resign, that those people who actually support him on the, on the ground now, and they are actually numerous, won't take up arms against the next government. Okay. It's what, only a fair what we, you know, what, process what that's we, going to guarantee What we are that. saying, and this is why a transitional government with full okay. authority that basically governs Syria till right. Assad is eased out of power. Thank you very much indeed, but not the last word on Syria. No, staying with Syria now. And uh, the lifting of the EU arms embargo comes as fierce clashes between government and opposition forces continue, including in the country's second largest city, Aleppo. Sky News is the first international news organisation to be allowed inside the 4,000-year-old walled city to see firsthand the destruction caused by the fighting. Our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, reports. Snipers changing shift amidst the rubble of this continuing war. In Aleppo, it's a stalemate, but the snipers never stop. This isn't any ordinary battlefield, however. It's one of the most significant ancient sites in the world, stretching back 4,000 years, and it's being destroyed bit by bit. Sky News is the first foreign organisation allowed inside Aleppo's Great Mosque, or what's left of it. Prayer rooms are burnt out. Much of it is now rubble. A tourist guide photograph is all that's left of its once magnificent central minaret. In the Great Hall, sheets and rugs have been strung up to protect from snipers. The rebels take no chances, running and ducking, hiding behind pillars. <laughs> and they're gonna build a wall here so no uh, RBJ or uh, snipers they can shoot at his tomb. That's his uh, profit. And so the shooting and the sniping and the bombing goes on all the time? Yes, it? yes, especially from this side. And they're side. ignoring the fact that it's yeah. an ancient mosque? We don't care. Huh? This side controlled by the government. Hmm. This side controlled by the rebel. Throughout the warren of streets, the FSA guard against a counter-offensive by government troops. We're right in the heart of the old city of Aleppo. This is the front line. The government troops are on the other side of that wall. There is a doorway through. And the snipers completely control the alleyways around it. Now, this is a, an ancient mosque, not the main mosque of the city. That's a short distance away. This uh, is a relic site. It's believed to have held the hairs of the Prophet Muhammad. And these men here are digging because they believe that uh, it is also the site of a mass grave. They say. They think that uh, rebel soldiers were shot by the regime forces before they left, and they think that their remains are buried inside. Surrounding the various mosques are the world-renowned covered markets of Aleppo. Some of the most intense fighting took place here, but their destruction came from government artillery and warplanes. Three quarters of the market uh, was destroyed and all the parts that were under their control they tried their best to protect but that part under the regime control was completely you can say destroyed because of shelling through the aircraft there's nothing to suggest that the fighting here will stop anytime soon the government forces are holed up in the city with little chance of getting out in this old part of the city, 
the government and rebel lines are literally one wall apart. What they've done is gone through some of the walls so that they can link up these ancient alleyways. The snipers all around. This whole area, World Heritage Site, is almost completely destroyed. The destruction here isn't complete, but it is extensive. It can be restored, of course. But in this war, tens of thousands of people are dying as well. And that can never be repaired. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Aleppo.